Hi, I'm Cameron Hunt, and this is Crash Course Gay Rights. Rebirth, Remergence, and Renaissance. So, in our last episode, we covered some of the history of the Roman Empire and how gay people had achieved a somewhat level of equality, at least within their social class, and, of course, men, who were citizens, could pretty much get away with anything, as long as they weren't seen as the submissive partner, because the cult of virility was more important to Rome than anything else. Roman society freely allowed sexual contact with anyone of a lower social rank, slaves, servants, entertainers, prostitutes, as long as the male citizen was not seen as a submissive partner. Emperor Hadrian, famous for his wall in Great Britain, loved a Greek boy named Antoninus, who he planned to marry until the boy was assassinated. Two Roman emperors, however, did get married. Nero married on two different occasions. Then there was Emperor Elagabalus, who married the Olympic athlete Zoeticus in a lavish ceremony that was the talk of Rome. But that all changed in 390 when Ep Emperor Theodosius I enacted laws which made the submissive partner in a gay relationship be punished by death. Now, of course, lesbians, women were less than important in the Roman Empire, were completely ignored by all these edicts as they were ignored entirely by recorded history for most of this period. Now, the Christian ideology continued to, to kind of latch on to the natural law idea that was introduced by Greek philosophy. And that had an important result in that their spiritual condemnation of God's laws and the idea of marriage and, and procreation acts, sexual acts, being only for the creation of children, made a, a very strict sexual morality for most of the Christian world. In fact, any activity that did not, that could not directly produce a child was seen as sinful, including masturbation and any form of sexual contact that didn't directly introduce a sperm to egg. Same reason why the Catholic Church still has a prohibition against condoms. So things were getting more difficult in the Roman Empire, and by the 500s, any suspicion of homosexual activity carried with it the punishment of death, death by immolation, and, just to top it all off, public castration. There was, however, a small bright spot. There was a Christian tradition of Adelophosis, which literally means brothers in Christ. St. Sergius and St. Bacchus in the 4th century actually underwent this ceremony, and historian John Boswell of Yale called it the first instance of gay marriage. So, as time went on, though, there was another bright spot, and that was Poland. In 966, when Poland was first institutionalized and became, a, became its own territory, its own country, it had, it had done away with any secular laws against homosexuality and refused to enforce the church's edicts against it. So, small bright spot. But generally, throughout Christian Europe, most gay people were put into the closet and hid from authorities. It's made it very hard to find any historical records of gay people because any that were found were usually killed. But what we're really going to talk about today is the Renaissance. Now, of course, many gay people were living in monastic situations. There was, of course, rumors of homosexuality in those monastic circles. Famously, the Knights Templar were accused of this, and it was one of the reasons that the French king um, invaded them on Friday the 13th and took them down. But in the Renaissance in Italy and in England, we see emergences of strong gay characters, people we can actually point to and be certain. Now, of course, a lot of gay people, like in Greece and Rome, were married to women while also engaging in very strong homosexual connections to other men. Mr. Hunt! Mr. Hunt! Yes, me from the past? Bi people were just greedy. Why would they get married and then also have gay relationships on the side? Well, that's a very simple way of thinking of it, but remember, marriage isn't about love at this point. Marriage is about property rights, it's about inheritance, it's about heirs. Women weren't seen as anything more than a vehicle for making heirs. And women were seen as the possession of most men. So you were either the possession of your father or the possession of your husband, and there was very little room in between. Even if you were widowed, you were often the possession of your oldest male son. In fact, he was your legal guardian, he made all your legal decisions, and had pretty much total control over you. But, moving on. 
by the 1400s, secret police organizations, and most famously the Spanish Inquisition, had begun to seek out homosexuals. Between 1400 and 1700, almost 20,000 people were prosecuted and punished for homosexuality, most notably in Florence. By the early 1400s, the Italian Renaissance had begun, and Florence became a major center of Renaissance art. One of the first great Renaissance artists, Donatello, was famous for picking his pupils and interns by their attractiveness, and made no secret of his homosexuality. The artist Michelangelo was adopted and raised by the Medici clan, and at first embraced the spirit of individuality embodied in his statue of David. But after the bonfire of the vanities created by the mad monk Savonarola rebelling against the lasciviousness and sexuality of the age, he became much more withdrawn, but still wrote hundreds of poems to young men, including Ignudio, a long-time lover whose portrait graces the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. In 1490, Leonardo da Vinci took on an apprentice named Salai, who, although a terrible artist, was a frequent inspiration for paintings. He was an extravagant dresser and numerous times overspent Leonardo's meager budget. It was Salai who, at the time of his death, was revealed to be the owner of the Mona Lisa, which means three out of the four Ninja Turtles were named after gay painters. So what I really want to talk about today is the obviously not gay Henry VIII, in 1533, outlawed homosexuality as a state matter and used the new law to target monks and take their property from the Catholic Church. His daughter Elizabeth I, trying to balance the Puritans and the Catholic mentality, also continued the outlaw of homosexuality, but the Renaissance had already firmly begun in her country, and she was also supporting the arts. Born in 1564, the same year as Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe did clandestine service for the British government under the first spymaster, Walsingham, in France, possibly even having gay relationships at a French Catholic monastic, which were trying to train subversives to go over to England. It was Marlowe, not Shakespeare, who was the most popular playwright of the time, and created the first long-form play and everything we think of now as Elizabethan drama. And his first play, Tamerlane, parts one and two, was the first time that anyone had written a long-form, five-acts drama in which we had a complicated protagonist, somebody who's not necessarily good or evil. All the plays up until this point had been morality plays, things that would highlight a historical character, or possibly a mythological one, show his vice, somehow his non-Christian goodness, and his destruction by it. In fact, many times the vices were actually personified as characters on the, on the stage, very similar to how Greek drama used to be in its most simplistic form, excepting, of course, the tragedians, who had, had more complicated pieces. But these personifications of evil of particular human sins on stage that would then tempt and destroy the main character. Also in that system was something called the Lives of the Saints, which were various dramatic pieces about how wonderful a particular saint was. It was a main way of, of course, informing a mainly illiterate public onto the various paradigms that they could model their life after, or at least that was the hope. Now, Drama had finally started to move away from the, under the auspices of the church and into an actual public domain. Um, theaters were going up and different plays were being put on and Tamerlane became an amazing success. It's a play about the warlord who um, is supposedly a descendant of Genghis Khan and conquers a huge swath of the Middle East and Asia and is vicious, destructive, and ruthless in his rise to power. But watching him be sympathetic, be interesting, be engaging, people were almost rooting for him, and something like that, rooting for a bad guy, had almost never happened before in the Western world. So, as we move along, Christopher Marlowe starts making more and more plays, and the one I really want to talk about is Edward II. Edward II 
was a king of England during the pre-Plantagenet era. His father, Edward I, had engaged war on Wales and on Scotland. In fact, the movie Braveheart features Edward I and his son, Edward II, who is obviously gay and whose lover gets defenestrated after he is engaged to Elizabeth, the Princess of France, um, who, of course, has a romantic relationship with Mel Gibson because, you know, why not? That is completely invented, but his lover Gaveston did get exiled from England, and when he became king, Edward II, after his father died, he revoked the exile of Gaveston. Gaveston came back, he became the actual Lord Chamberlain, um, Edward I made him a lord, um, and put him above all the other lords, and that led to great tension inside the court. Um, eventually, Gaveston is forced to be exiled again by the Parliament of the Nobles. Um, in fact, Edward II is mainly noted in the history books for the expansion of power of Parliament during his reign. That exile and then rebringing back, power went back and forth a few times over the 20-year reign, and the Hundred Years' War was just starting to set up in which France and England battled over territory in England. In fact, the King of England owned about a quarter to half of France um, during this period. Eventually, Isabella, the king's wife, the queen, um, makes an alliance with a nobleman named Mortimer, who had been exiled. They form an army, they reinvade, they take over and dethrone Edward. But this kind of well-known fact, and Gaveston, who was blamed for the downfall of King Edward um, by the historical records that had been kept of the day and by historical commentators, even contemporary ones, um, what He made him a sympathetic character. He showed Gaveston as a man of low birth who was raised up by his relationship with the king, 